It's nine in the morning in, in Spain, so good morning everyone and uh, good evening uh, for those who are in, in Australia. It's a real pleasure to be with you in this session organized by the Spain Australia Council Foundation. We are accompanied by the ambassador of the two countries, ambassador of Australia to Spain, Sofia McIntyre, and ambassador of Spain to Australia, Alicia Moral. Thanks for being here, it's a, it's a pleasure. I greatly appreciate um, the opportunity to moderate the dialogue of, on the Indo-Pacific between Professor Rory Metcalf. Uh, Professor Metcalf is uh, head of the National Security College at the Australian National University, and Colonel Pardo de Santayano, a research coordinator at the Spanish Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, welcome, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, as you probably know, and we, we all of us know that the Indo-Pacific has become the, the focus of all eyes. Uh, many different dynamics uh, have been taking place in this region for years, but uh, one of them stands out and condition all, all the others, all the others dynamic in the region. And that dynamic is the, 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 the growing competition between China and the United States. Um, this competition uh, has become an open rivalry uh, uh, that seems to, to define a new uh, international order. For me, as an, as an editor of a, of a journal in international affairs, the moment is, is, is worrying, but at the same time, it's very uh, it's, we, we certainly have the impression we are entering a completely new world. So, um, and, and for a European and Atlantic country, uh, such as Spain, the emergence of the Indo-Pacific strategic scenario is, is causing something similar to an um, existential crisis, as it led us to ask ourselves what is our place in the world and to, today, and, and all, above all, what is, our, uh, what is going to be our role in the near future? It is a, a profound uh, reflection in all areas, in political, economic affairs, but mainly in the field of security and defense. Uh, Professor Metcalf and Colonel Pardo de Santayana are going to talk about all of this. Um, we only have uh, an hour for this conversation and I don't want to, to take up any more of, of, of the time of the session. Um, because we would like to have some minutes at the end of the session for the questions from, from the audience. Just let me inform you that this session is, is being recorded. Um, for technical reasons, please uh, keep your mic off when you are not speaking. And you can sub submit your questions at any time during the session through the, the, the chat, through the Zoom chat, um, or you can also use the hand raising tool in the in the in Zoom. And before the conversation between uh, Professor Metcalf and Colonel Pardo de Santayana starts, I will give the floor um, to the president of the Spain Australia Council Foundation, Mr. Joaquin Molinero. And uh, after Molinero, uh, the ambassador of Australia to Spain, uh, uh, Sofia Macuantar, and the ambassador of Spain to, to Australia, Alicia Moral, they will take the floor for some minutes. Uh, to, to, to give a brief introductory uh, remarks. So thank you very much, um, Mr. Molinero, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aurea. Good morning, good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Spain Australia Council Foundation, I would like to welcome to all of you to this seminar on the Indo-Pacific situation. A particular welcome to both ambassadors, Sofia McIntyre, Ambassador of Australia to Spain, and Alicia Moral, Ambassador of Spain to Australia. As always, it's a great satisfaction to have you on board. And I'm particularly thankful for your efforts toward the success of this uh, meeting. Just a very brief words on the foundation for those who connect for the first time with this uh, initiative. 
the Spain Australia Council Foundation, which I'm honored to, to chair, is a non-profit uh, private initiative promoted by the Spanish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Our trustees come from the governmental, academic, and business fields, and they are at the forefront of today's Spain, a modern, innovative, competitive, and high technological country. You may find a complete information about us in our webpage, but allow me to underline that we are together in this excellent public diplomacy tool with just one common objective, which is to promote initiatives and contacts in order to foster mutual understanding and cooperation between Australian and Spanish civil societies. Our two countries are becoming progressively closer thanks to an increasingly fluid bilateral relationship based on common values, strategies, and interest in a globalized world. And this is obvious, particularly in the economic field. Nowadays, many Spanish companies like Acciona, CAF, CaixaBank, Iberdrola, Indra, and many others are offering a relevant contribution in sectors such as infrastructures, renewable energy, water treatment management, defense, financial services, or consumer goods, among others. And the Spain Australia Foundation in this very positive uh, framework assumes the challenge to keep the momentum on this rich bilateral relationship and to strive to open new chapters that allow, that allow our uh, fellow citizens to work even closer in the near future in Australia, in Spain, or in any other corner of our planet. A seminar like this on the uh, Indo-Pacific region with such a prestigious panel of experts is a great occasion to advance toward this goal and to exam examine how the center of the gravity of today's geopolitics is quickly moving to this complex region with some conflicts and a lot of opportunities. I hope you will enjoy this, this uh, seminar and thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Molinedo. Molinedo uh, now uh, I will give the, the floor to Ambassador Sofia Maquantar. Uh, Ambassador, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Marshall. Uh, good morning, everyone, to the members of the board, Secretary General, Ambassador Morale, Colonel Padre de Santayana, Ms. Medka, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's very nice to see so many familiar faces on the, on the screen. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Foundation for this great initiative. The Spain Australia Council Foundation is a great asset to our bilateral relationship. It doesn't just work on improving our understanding of economic opportunities and context uh, in the economic relationship, but also um, putting on timely events such as this really helps to build understanding of the strategic context in our region. Uh, and you have two excellent speakers today for that very purpose. Professor Medcalf is a trusted and highly regarded authority on the region. And the author also of a number of excellent books, which I recommend to anyone looking to better understand China and the Indo-Pacific. The situation in the Indo-Pacific has obviously been a keenly discussed topic since the announcement of the Balkans partnership in mid-September. The announcement of the partnership and Australia's decision to acquire nuclear powered submarines has intensified focus on the deteriorating security situation in the region and the reasons why Australia took this difficult decision. There are many aspects to that discussion, which I hope will be canvassed to some degree today, but in the interests of brevity, I really wanted to underline the simple point that Australia places great importance on Europe as a partner in the region. Our shared values and interests shore up the rules-based order, which is essential to shaping an open, inclusive and secure Indo-Pacific. Spain plays an important role in this as a major defence industry partner for Australia, as a like-minded economic partner which supports a fair rules-based international trading system, and as a defender of a global order which promotes a world where all countries' sovereignty and rights are respected, regardless of their level of development. 
That's, that's my key message for today. Um, as I said, I hope that uh, the discussion will bring out some more of the, the issues which we've seen analysed and debated in Spain and across Europe over the last month or so. I'm very much looking forward to hearing, um, hearing everybody's input. And with that, I'll, I'll hand back to the moderator. Thank you very much for your words, Ambassador McQuinter. And now uh, it's a pleasure to, to greet the Spanish Ambassador to Australia, Mrs. Alicia Moral. Uh, cuando quiera, embajadora, la escuchamos. Alicia, no has quitado el mute. Hola, Hussein. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning in Spain to everyone. Good, good evening here in, in Australia. First of all, I would like to um, thank the Council Foundation for uh, inviting me to participate in this dialogue with some brief introductory remarks. And I want to congratulate you because I think it's a very interesting uh, initiative. I, I think it's going to be of great interest to, to the members of the board of the foundation and also to all the participants in this dialogue, including some Spanish and Australian think tanks. And as you have already said, uh, the, the chair has already said, um, uh, it's a very relevant issue and very timely. Uh, and not only because uh, the Indo-Pacific has become in the last years the center of the world uh, um, in terms in strategic and economic terms, but especially for the very serious challenges in security. And also I would say for the opportunities that bring not only to the uh, countries of the region like Australia, but also to other actors uh, with global interests like uh, the European Union and some member states. Spain doesn't have a strategy for the Indo-Pacific yet, but uh, we have been very supportive of the uh, European Union strategy that you know um, was launched very recently. And uh, well, I think we will be very um, active in its implementation. I want to say also that Spain has a strong presence in the region, the region of the Indo-Pacific with important in economic interests. We have 15 embassies, nine consulates, 16 uh, economic and of, uh, commercial offices, five Instituto Cervantes, and five tourist offices. Um, with Australia, um, uh, well, we have uh, important, uh, one of the main actors in the, in the region of the Indo-Pacific. We have very important, uh, strong bilateral relations. Uh, in the last 15 years, an increasing number of Spanish companies are here in Australia with very important projects. I always like to mention when I meet with my uh, Australian counterparts that 60% uh, of the Australian fleet has been built by one Spanish company, Navantia. Um, all these companies are, uh, most of them, uh, or many of them, are members of the Council Foundation, and some of them are participating today in this dialogue. I'm sure that this, um, that this initiative will contribute to raise awareness of the importance of the region and of the challenges to security and uh, well, of course, to the mutual understanding between our two countries. Um, and finally, I just uh, very briefly, I think my two minutes have already finished, but I want to thank Professor Rory Metcalf for uh, participating in this dialogue. We met uh, some months ago, and, and, I, and I believe it's a, it's a privilege to have you here. And I'm sure that he will bring very interesting perspectives to these uh, discussions about the challenges in the Indo-Pacific. So I wish you all uh, that uh, we have very interesting um, uh, dialogue today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And thank you all for, for, for respect the time assigned uh, so that we have uh, time enough for our session and for some final questions. And, uh, and now uh, let's start the, the, the dialogue. Um, Professor Metcalf, uh, Colonel Pardo de Santayana, you will have an initial 10 minutes for an overview uh, on, of the topic. And we will start with uh, Professor Metcalf. And let me, gi let, me, um, let me give you the floor by asking, asking a question. Why is the Indo-Pacific uh, as a strategic concept and, and how does it affect national interests and strategies? 
Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. And thank you also to the, the ambassadors uh, and indeed to our hosts for those kind opening remarks. Look, uh, at one level, the, the, you know, the concept of a, a mental map, uh, a geopolitical construct like the Indo-Pacific or uh, the Asia-Pacific or Eurasia or the Middle East, you know, these, these concepts are, are interesting academically, but it's a good question to say, so what? How does it matter for policy? Well, I would argue that the idea of the Indo-Pacific as a strategic concept uh, has become very important for a number of countries in this region and increasingly globally. Australia was an early mover, uh, a pioneer of this idea about, um, about 10 years ago. And increasingly in the last few years, we've seen many countries adopt this idea in their strategic documents, in their policy priorities. Uh, you know, the European Union itself, of course, as we know, has recently announced its Indo-Pacific strategy. What does this all mean? So it's essentially an idea about looking at the, the connectivity of the two oceans, the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, looking at those oceans as one strategic system where, if you like, the, uh, the power relations of, of major countries in that region and of global stakeholders connected to that region uh, interact with one another in highly consequential ways strategically. It's about the, um, the prioritisation, I think, of this region as a a center of gravity for, uh, for power politics, for economics and for uh, demography. This is the region where, if you like, the, um, the engine of global economic growth has been in recent years. It's the region where powerful countries are competing for influence. And it's also the region where there's been a lot of modernization of military capabilities, especially in the maritime domain. And a lot of this is about China. So from an Australian perspective, over the past 10 years, we've seen the, um, the trade, the investment, the infrastructure connections, and especially the energy connections. Look at, for example, the dependence of China Japan, Korea, for example, on the sea lanes of the Indian Ocean for their energy security. We have seen all of these, uh, these arteries of connectivity, of economic connectivity, become more important for our own security and for the prosperity and security of all countries in our region. It's no longer realistic to imagine that this region is divided into small, um, neat compartments like East Asia or South Asia, like the Pacific or the Indian Ocean, there's a general connectivity. And importantly, it's a connectivity to the global strategic system and to the global economy. Uh, it's a paradox, it's a strange thing to say, but although the Indo-Pacific is a regional strategic construct, it's also the global region. It's the region that is most connected to the global system. Uh, this matters enormously to Australia because firstly, this is the region that is in every sense our, our home, our geographic home, but it's also the region where so many of the key countries with which we have economic or strategic relations and dependencies are located. And importantly, the rise of China uh, as a trading power, as an outwardly focused economic player, but also as an assertive and, in my view, coercive strategic actor in recent years, has been and this is where I'll be a little bit controversial, has become almost a, a quasi-imperial project across the Indo-Pacific. In fact, um, one of the editions of my book, the international edition of my book, uh, is titled Indo-Pacific Empire because it looks, in fact, at the, um, some of the imperial or, or neo-colonial qualities of China's activity in the region, the Belt and Road Initiative, commercial and economic 
agendas, yes, but with a security footprint and with an expectation created among the Chinese people that the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party will protect their interests across this vast Indo-Pacific region, the Maritime Silk Road. So to, to move to the relevance of all of this, I think for Australia and indeed for Spain, I would say a few things just to, to conclude these remarks. I would say that for Australia, we are now operating in a complex interconnected super region, the Indo-Pacific. It's a region that is predominantly maritime in character, which actually brings advantages uh, to countries like Australia that are significant maritime players. And there I will acknowledge, you know, the very uh, important and intimate role of the shipbuilding uh, partnership that we've had for, for many years for the modernization of the Australian Navy. The Indo-Pacific is a maritime region and China's naval modernization, I think is a very stark signal of, of China's own ambitions in this region. The Indo-Pacific is a multipolar region. And I think that's very important when we're looking at the interests and the agency of countries like Spain, like Australia, countries that are not uh, great powers, we're not superpowers, uh, we're, if you like, middle powers of different qualities, but we're significant countries with interests in the preservation of a rules-based order in this region that is central to global prosperity. And so the idea of the Indo-Pacific as a strategic construct is partly about leveraging multipolarity. It's about leveraging the interests and the capabilities of many countries to bring some sort of stability and balance to a region where there is a lot of strategic anxiety. There is concern, particularly about the, um, the power play, if I can call it that, that China has embarked upon in recent years, perhaps a bid to dominate this two ocean region. But there's also anxiety about the reliability of the United States as, uh, as our ally and as the only power that can really lead in preventing uh, China's dominance or preserving a stable rules-based order. So the Indo-Pacific is partly an experiment. Um, the only experiment we have, the only opportunity we have to build new coalitions, to engage as many countries as possible to register our interests in this globally central region and to encourage uh, balance and stability. Importantly, Australia is not alone in this journey. Um, although it was eight years ago, I think that the Australian Defence White Paper was the, in, the first time a government declared the Indo-Pacific, uh, not the Asia-Pacific, is our region of strategic interest. Since then, we've seen Japan, India, Indonesia, all of the ASEAN countries, the United States, and of course, a range of European partners embrace variants of the idea of the Indo-Pacific as a framework for their strategic policy in this region. And I'm very interested in identifying what are the commonalities and the convergences um, among our different Indo-Pacific postures so that we can, we can work together to a maximum degree possible. Now, um, I'll conclude on the, you know, the important note to say that uh, recent developments have reinforced the importance of the Indo-Pacific idea, but have also challenged um, the assumption that we can find easy convergence of our, um, our interests and our behaviour. What are the recent developments? I think the, the impact of the pandemic has reinforced the view that in fact, China has increased its assertiveness that it has, China has not chosen the moment of the pandemic as an opportunity for greater collaboration in this region. But if you look at China's behavior towards Australia coercively uh, in its economic diplomacy, towards India, towards Japan, the Philippines, many countries in this region, it's not been a happy story. And of course, uh, China's uh, threats towards Taiwan. At the same time, we've seen increased pushback and coalition building 
under the banner of the Indo-Pacific, and I think the Quad, Australia, India, the United States and Japan, is the most important of the new coalitions that we've seen forming to use the idea of the Indo-Pacific as a, a glue, as a, a connective tissue for our coalitions. Uh, but at the same time, there, 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 are, there are difficulties in the Indo-Pacific family. Uh, the AUKUS uh, announcement that the Australian, uh, British and American governments made last month um, has been challenging, is challenging at a diplomatic level at a strategic and military level, I think it makes a lot of sense, and we can talk about that uh, perhaps later on. Uh, nuclear powered submarines are the capability that Australia needs given our extraordinary geography and our geopolitical challenges. But diplomatically, uh, and particularly in terms of the, uh, the, the, the damage, I would say, to the relationship with France, we've got some hard work to do now, and we would want to work with as many European partners uh, in reinforcing the convergence and the commonality of our interests in a rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. I will stop there um, to save time for my, uh, my Spanish colleague and for the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the Council Foundation Spain Australia for organizing this event. I absolutely agree that we need to start to think about Indo-Pacific. And in fact, I think that uh, looking into Indo-Pacific is really what we need to understand, as Aurea Molto said, what is our position in the world? Not just to solve the, our Indo-Pacific strategy, but to understand what is our position in the world. And the world is changing so dramatically that we have to understand that we have to change as well our understanding of what is our position in the world. And I'm very interested in having this discussion with Australia because I could absolutely agree that Indo-Pacific is now the center of gravity of, of the planet. And what happens in the Indo-Pacific will have an amazing influence in Spain on all over the world. And Australia is becoming the outpost of the, of the Western world in the region. I think it's the only country that really has a deep and old knowledge of what's going on in, in, in the region. And uh, almost everyone agree that we are where we are because we were not understanding what was going on in the region. We are acting too, we are too late in reacting to what's happening in the region. Uh, Spanish ambassador Bregolat even says, if the United States is trying to stop the China rise, it's already too late. So I think that this discussion is really needed. And I, I absolutely agree with uh, the article written by Kevin Rood, where he said, short of words, say, this is a decade of living dangerously. So the word danger is very important. So it depends what we do in the region or what we do not do in the region, uh, we, uh, the, the situation will change. And we start to hear about an existential threat. And we start to hear about Many things, for example, many analysts say that China is a greater challenge than the Soviet Union was. So these are many questions. We have today more questions than answers. So when I was writing in the paper to Rory Metcalf, I was putting a lot of questions. We do not have answers yet, and we need to have answers to these questions before we can give an, uh, have an idea what is our strategy. Today, today, the Spanish answer to, to this challenge is, is looking to the European Union. And I have, I have to say, as a Spanish analyst, the future of Spain and the, this future of, uh, of our position in the world depends on our capacity to build a stronger European Union. Somehow, in a black or white statement, I would say, we have a stronger European Union or we become irrelevant. Our nations are not big enough to face the challenges of the future. So I would say this, that we are losing a strategic critical um, mass. So we haven't the critical mass in the strategic and geopolitical dimension to act uh, and to react and to have an influence in the world. 
So the only response, the only possibility really is to deepen the European Union dimension. And this is a political challenge, not a security challenge. So the only possibility to have a European Union strategy, a serious European Union strategy in the Indo-Pacific is really a political dimension inside the European Union. So this would be really my main message is it is European Union or nothing. We cannot have a Spanish strategy alone for the Indo-Pacific. And once we have a solid European Union strategy, we can start to think in a serious engagement with uh, our partners in the region, but not independently. It would be useless. Huh? So this would be my, my first message. The, the second is that I do not think that NATO is the instrument for the Indo-Pacific. NATO should remain in, in the uh, geographical area where it was founded. And what is reasonable is that we Europeans do a stronger effort in our own region so that the United States can devote a greater attention, a great, greater effort elsewhere, specifically in the, in the Indo-Pacific. And this is, where, this is the way I understand the strategic autonomy, which I think is key for us, which is a stronger European Union and a stronger commitment of Europe in NATO. It's not against the United States, it's to permit the United States to focus in another part. The other great question is, if China is such a challenge, can we maintain simultaneously a, a strong strategy against China and a strong strategy against Russia simultaneously, when both are having a strategic partnership that reinforces, reinforces the security profile of both, um, both countries? Personally, my response is not. In this new strategic environment, we cannot uh, have the, the both um, strong nations uh, together. I, I'm very much in the Kissinger line that we have to work for avoiding this uh, close relationship between China and Russia. We need, I completely agree, a more multipolar world, which means we need a strong European Union, we need a strong India, and we need China and Russia not so close one to the, the other. In this, in this kind of multipolar world, I can imagine a future. But I cannot imagine a future in a situation where US and China are going more and more confrontational. When I was reading the last number of foreign affairs, and I was reading John Merschheimer and his idea that the United States and China have to confront with the idea of the United States at the end winning over China, I was very much afraid. And I, I would say that better to sp stay outside than to join this idea because the key today is time and the future. We cannot think about how the situation today. We need to think how will the situation look like in the future. So a two confrontational approach, the idea that China's rights have to be stopped at any cost has not an amazing economical um, cost that Spain cannot pay because then it would be Spain before China that would collapse inside. We need the, the, the economy working and the second is, if, if at the end China wins, then the future will be horrendous. So if we now speak about Kenan, Kenan is everywhere now. In every article we read about uh, in foreign affairs and other places, we see Kenan and people are asking, we need a new long telegram, as Revista Politica Stereo told us some months ago. Kenan built a strategy based on first understanding what's going on, understanding the psychology of the rival, then proposing a strategy, a containment strategy. But then he said, and we have to take time so that this strategy can have a positive result. My question is, do we have time to wait? Because if time is playing in favor of China, we have to very seriously think what will be the strategy to face the China challenge. We cannot forget that time is today the key element of our strategy. And if at the end we think that China will prevail, we have to incorporate this element in our strategy today because a too confrontational approach with China would create at the end a horrendous future. 
a very difficult future to manage with. So we have amazing challenges. This, the main challenge is at home, is really to, to convince the other European partners that we have to build a strong European Union. And then from a strong European Union and a solid NATO in our own region, trying to build really a multipolar world. And this is basically the ideas I would like to share with you. Well, thank you very much, Colonel Pardo de Santayana and Professor Metcalf. I think with these uh, first interventions, with your first uh, remarks, uh, the debate is even more interesting than, than we thought. Um, it's true that for us in Spain, the Australian point of view is of enormous value. Uh, so I would therefore like to ask another question to Professor Metcalf. Uh, and this is uh, uh, after the response of the Europeans, especially France, uh, to the AUKUS deal. Did Australia get the impression that the European Union did not understand the challenge that China posed to a country like Australia? Look, thank you. Um, look, I, I, I would I would characterize the dynamic uh, a little differently. I mean, I would say that you know a number of European countries and the European Union collectively, and certainly NATO collectively, have increasingly been recognizing not only the opportunities from China and China's economic rise, but the risks from Chinese power over recent years. And those risks are not simply, uh, if you like, military or maritime risks in the Indo-Pacific. They're risks to do with sovereignty, with information, with political interference, with economic coercion. Uh, with the, you know the, the the negative side, if you like, of China's global presence, and I think that there is a growing awareness of those risks within Europe. I think it's uneven. I think it's different from country to country. I think it's it's different in different regard to different industries. But the core principles of the European Union, you know, principles to do with uh, democratic rights, with um, with equality, with political freedoms, uh, with sovereignty and, and, and mutual respect, all of those principles that were hard won throughout European history. Um, I think that there is a recognition that those principles are being, are being challenged. So for Australia, yes, I think it's fair to say that Australia was uh, an early mover in regard to responding to Chinese power. The metaphor of uh, canary in a coal mine has been used to say that Australia was the early warning system um, for much of the democratic world on Chinese power. And we are closer geographically to a lot of the challenges. We have uh, neighbours in our region, for example, in the South Pacific or the Indian Ocean uh, or the South China Sea, who are feeling very direct pressure from Chinese influence or military power. So Australia feels this more acutely, I would say, than European powers. But I don't think that uh, Australian policy leaders therefore think that Europe doesn't understand. I think it's a, it, it's a journey at different speeds. But it's interesting to see, for example, the way in which a country like Britain has, has turned around on China in recent years. You know, five years ago, Britain was talking about a golden age of China. It was all about commerce. It was all about economics. And there was very little attention paid to the military challenge, cyber security risk, uh, human rights, Hong Kong, et cetera. That has changed profoundly in a very short time. And I think we will continue to see this change in Europe. You know, the experience of Sweden or Lithuania or the Czech Republic, so many European countries that have been bullied in different ways by China. I think that the AUKUS um, controversy does pose a different kind of challenge. It, it's not that we don't think Europe understands the problems in this region, I think it's that um, at an, in Australia, we've been working on two tracks for a long time. 
to manage the China challenge, a diplomatic track, which is about being as inclusive as possible in the Indo-Pacific to engage as many players as partners to build and protect a rules-based order, and a strategic track where we are increasing our defence capabilities and we are an ally of the United States and we are part of, I think, a system that is designed to balance Chinese power. The AUKUS uh, controversy identified the, the tensions between those two tracks and we're still trying to resolve those tensions. But I do think that, uh, and this is where I, I would respectfully have a different view perhaps to my colleague on the, on the panel, um, I do think that it's going to be impossible for us to rely on the diplomatic track alone in managing Chinese power. And that if there are circumstances of confrontation, uh, it will be China's choice to initiate that confrontation. And so that's why deterrence has become part of the picture now. I completely agree that deterrence has to be part of the picture. And, but the question is, do we have any kind of control to avoid that this strategic approach will end in a catastrophe? Because, because if I have to choose between a strong confrontation or just accepting China rise, I would prefer accepting China rise and adapt to circumstances. Because the idea of, for example, China attacking Taiwan and the United States responding and creating a new world war is, is, is a nightmare. So, and, and I think that the probability of China attacking Taiwan is very high. So we need to know what exactly is the approach. And I said, I was reading John Mersheimer and I'm very much concerned. He's saying we won the Germans twice, we, John did, we won the Japanese and we won the, the Soviet Union. And we, we, this time we will win, win and prevail over China even if he recognizes that the future is playing in favor of China. So this means that the United States has a very short time to prevail over China. And this idea that the United States thinks that it has no time, like it had in Kenan time, to, to have a strategy could deal us to mistakes in strategic terms. The great advantage of the United States was always that time was playing in its favor. And I have serious doubts that this time Time is playing in the favor of the United States. And um, this could lead to mistakes. Many people speak we are close to a first world war scenario where time was again the key. The world, first world war happened because nobody could control time, the timing of the process. And now we, we could lose the timing of the process. And in the United States, some people are starting to think if we do not react today, tomorrow it will be too late. So you said at the beginning, we, we have a difficulty really to, to put, put, we cannot put all our eggs in the US basket. We need to have, from the European Union perspective, we need to have a, a stronger footprint. We cannot just say, well, we have the Americans, like we had them in NATO. So the, the, the strategic situation is very complicated. There is no guarantee that, that the West will prevail in this. And once, if the West does not prevail and has too strong a strategy, too aggressive strategy, some countries will pay for this. I'm not thinking about Spain because Spain has not had a historical bad relationship with China. Spain is somehow an exception from the perspective of the Chinese feelings. For 350 years, Spain had a very good relationship with China. And uh, even the Jesuits were accepted in the court in, in China. And we just had trade. But there are other countries like Great Britain, like France, like the United States, that have a bad historical experience. And Chinese have a good memories. So uh, now we see that China is acting from our resentment. They are using nationalism, which is reinforcing this resentment. So uh, we, we have to think about the consequences of the strategy. And this is, this is my concern. This is why I think Australia is so important because Australia understands better than us what's going on. And, uh, and Australia somehow could be playing as all or nothing strategy if Australia makes a mistake. 
because even if Australia has not historical difficulties with China and has had a very positive experience for a long time, uh, a reaction, an overreaction of China against Australia is very dangerous as well. So Australia is becoming our hero in the region, somehow we could say. And so, uh, uh, but at the same time, we are very much concerned. Too many challenges, too many dangers in the future. So we have to go step by step and we have to know what are the, how, what we have integrated into the strategy to be sure. I remember when the Cold War finished, some people said, it's a pity that the Cold War finishes because we have learned to manage it. Now I would say we don't know how to manage the situation. This is my, my idea. Thank you very much, Colonel. We have already um, uh, some questions, but uh, before I start with the, the questions from the audience, uh, I can resist, I can constrain myself of, uh, of, uh, of a question to, to Professor Metcalf. Um, Professor, do you share the, the Colonel's Pardo de Santayana impression that the risk of a war because of Taiwan is really very high? Look, I mean, there's, there's clearly a risk of conflict. Um, and interestingly, uh, some, um, some uh, financial market analysts in Australia recently produced research that placed that risk as high as, as, high as 50%, but over the next few years. But I'm not sure. I mean, we, don't, we're, we are all dealing with unknowns here. And the, I guess, the rational, the rational response from a Chinese point of view, I know the First World War was not a rational event in human history, um, but, you know, there is still a high degree of risk involved for China to launch all out uh, invasion and annexation of Taiwan. Uh, China prefers to win without fighting. That's been the strategy for many years now, you know, the PLA have not fired a shot uh, really in anger since they, they killed their own citizens in 1989. Um, you know, Indian troops died on the border recently in a clash, but it was kind of an accidental small scale clash. So the PLA is becoming very militarily powerful, but I still think there is a certain degree of caution in proceeding to all out war. Now, the challenge for us is how do we deter um, collectively? How do we manage escalation. I, I agree that if, if major conflict begins, then escalation control will be difficult and the signalling of that will be difficult. But also, how do we send signals that prevent and discourage the extreme pressure and coercion that China is mounting in circumstances short of war? Because what is happening now is coercion against Taiwan, coercion against Australia, coercion against India, coercion against Japan, coercion against the Philippines, you know, the list goes on. I don't think any of these other players are choosing confrontation. And I think the Australian experience is very educational because five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people were looking at Australia saying, look, you have this close relationship with China, you're economically dependent on China, um, but you're getting rich and you're going to live happily ever after. And Australia did not choose to change that fairy tale the fairy tale changed. China chose to change it. And it's because I think of the fundamental clash of political systems and the clash of political systems does not respect geography. So I think that's why sooner or later, I think every country in Europe is going to feel some degree of the kind of pain that Australia has experienced if that country is a democracy. Um, Sorry to be, uh, you know, not provide a happy story there, um, but I do think that while the risk of war is not perhaps as great as the Colonel suggests, uh, of course the risk is real and the challenge for us is to send the right deterrent signals that reduce that risk. Yes, um, Thank you. One, yes, Aurea? Yes, um, Colonel, just remind, just remind that we have two questions from the audience. So I would appreciate if, if your, your remarks are very brief so that we can, we can open the debate. Yes, one of the, the, the main concern is I see it very difficult to have an influence of Chinese behavior from outside. 
So what is the reaction in China is exactly the opposite. All the pressure it, but with, that the West is putting on, on China is producing the opposite effect. Is China is closing down, is be becoming more aggressive. It's a similar, a similar pattern than what we have seen with Russia. All the pressure we have put in Russia and we have a more aggressive Russia. We have put the pressure of Russia in, in its own geographical environment then we are seeing them in the Middle East and we are seeing them now in Africa. So it, I see it very difficult to have an influence on, on what is going on in, internally in, in China or its own ideology. I see the opposite. China today is, is ideologically more aggressive and more closed than it was some years ago. And how we will change this, I see it, it's, for me, it's very difficult. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, three questions. And the first one uh, says, um, I would like to ask about the views of the speakers on the new dialogue of, on the Indo-Pacific by, by US, India, Israel, and the United Emirates Arab and its impact in the region. Can, can I suggest, uh, Chair, I, I'm very happy if you yeah. ask Collect. all the questions and then okay. we can just sure. do our best sure. to answer them. So sure. you're right, you're right. And another question says that, uh, what role could or should play, if any, cultural diplomacy as an element of the European Union strategy for helping to decrease the tension in the Indo-Pacific region? And we have another question. Uh, says, are we facing a new Cold War accelerated by digital threats? Um, are we going to face uh, a brand new world of regional fragmentation? Is diplomacy a tool to reach uh, to a better understanding of these threats? These are the three questions we have right now. So you, Professor and Colonel Pardo Santayana can can answer uh, the questions you, you you want. Thank you. Would you like me to go first? Okay, sure. look, perfect. Thanks. So briefly on all of those points, um, the new interesting um, India, UAE, Israel, United States quad um, is another example of India being, I think, a very creative and activist diplomatic player. Um, you know, India is critical to Australian policy in the Indo-Pacific now, the, the, the big quad, uh, India, Australia, US, Japan. And that's where I think, you know, we, we have to try to move our mindset away from, this is all about the United States versus China. I mean, if the United States were less confrontational towards China, we would still see China putting pressure on India, for example. And India is a country weaker than China, but very capable of standing up for itself uh, in every regard. So I think that we should situate the new quad in this much larger array of activist Indian diplomacy. And India is now being very open-minded and importantly, moving away from its traditional non-alignment. I mean, there was a time where India would not have had a strong open relationship with Israel and, and, now, and now does. So I think this is actually reassuring because it shows that India is becoming a really useful partner for a wide range of countries in the region. And Indian mistrust, mistrust of China is now very deep. On the question of culture, it depends. I think if we're talking about soft power in the sense of helping to develop the institutions of democracy in, and, and liberal democratic values in the Indo-Pacific, then yes, um, I think that is a useful thing. I think culture in a more abstract sense is not particularly useful in managing the challenges of the region. Um, but I would say that we should not give up on promoting and supporting our values in the Indo-Pacific. For example, while on the one hand, China looks you know, like increasingly a rigid, almost totalitarian state, um, the fact is that wealthy Chinese still like to send their children and their money to Western countries um, 
for education, for their almost for their um, their escape hatch, their escape route. If things go wrong in China, I think there is a brittleness in the Chinese system that we sometimes forget, and the way in which the leadership is cracking down on corruption or on rivals or on culture um, is actually uh, going to make China, I think, more brittle in the long run. Digital, um, the digital element there. Look, I think China is seeking to dominate. Emerging and critical technologies, especially cyberspace, artificial intelligence, and the like. Look, on the one hand, there is a diplomatic response. We should, of course, be working to build the norms, um, norms around digital technologies that respect privacy and political freedom, and if you like, liberal democratic values. But that's not going to be sufficient. And so, uh, Australia, for example has an openly declared offensive cyber capability. Uh, we have openly declared that we have used that from time to time, particularly against terrorist and extremist groups. Um, I don't know um, the true extent of Australia's cyber operations when it comes to international relations or great power relations, but there's going to be a need for a degree of deterrence alongside diplomacy in cyberspace as well. I, I fear diplomacy will not be enough. Um, so that's those, those three questions, but I just wanted to emphasize in closing that we have to keep asking ourselves the question, is time really on China's side? Um, China spends a lot of money projecting this image of greatness, uh, but if you look at the, uh, the real estate bubble in China, if you look at the demographics in China, uh, if you look at the natural environment in China, there are many questions about China's future. There is no succession plan for the leadership. Uh, there is a frontier of, of, of risky relationships. So I think we also need to be more confident in our own institutions and in our own um, the resilience of our own countries. Thank you. So I completely agree that one of the key elements today is the resi resilience of our own country. To, with, this is basic. We will go through difficult times. And it is true that China has difficulties, but our own societies are very much divided. So we have to put the focus on rebuilding societies which are confident in themselves, that have not this strong confrontational approaches inside. And uh, I, I basically agree with everything that has been said. And they say, if we have an exclusively security approach, this is very dangerous. So we need to have cultural approaches, diplomatic approaches, and many approaches to avoid, to have just this view of, of we have an enemy in front of us. And so we know that there is a Clausewitzian principle, which is confrontation has a tendency to grow by itself. So if you do not put limits, to, to confrontation, by nature, confrontation grows. And this is a danger in itself. And this is all I, I think uh, I can say, and I, I am very afraid that time is playing this time against us. Yes, we, we only have two minutes left. I think that this, this has been a very exciting, a very interesting uh, conversation. Thank you very much, Professor Metcalf and Colonel Pardo de Santayana. I think that uh, this session has uh, lived up to the enormous interest uh, of the topic. Uh, unfortunately, the, the time is, is very short, was too short, uh, but I'm sure that this debate uh, will be followed by, by many others in, in the near future. And, and I'm sure that the, the Australia Spain uh, uh, Council Foundation is going to, to, to organize uh, more sessions and seminars like, like this. Um, I give the floor to the president of the Spain Australia Council Foundation, Joaquin Moyenedo, who will close uh, today's session. Thank you very much. It has been a, a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Aurea. Thank you very much to all of you panelists and, and attendees for being part of, of this interesting initiative. And particularly thanks to Professor Metcalf and Colonel Pardo de Santayana. You both have provide to us with a lot of food of thoughts to, for a better understanding of this complex and challenging situation in the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, area. I think it's clear that this uh, 
this is a region that will be, that is currently one of the center of the geopolitics and uh, international relations with a lot of implications, uh, of course, in at security level, but also at economic uh, diplomacy and uh, cultural exchanges. Australia has launched this debate because in fact is one of the main actors in this region by itself and through the AUKUS initiative. And I hope that uh, Spain with uh, its partners in the European Union uh, will join forces in order to cooperate and to play the appropriate role in that uh, region. Uh, for sure, from the uh, Spain Australia Council Foundation, we will follow very closely this process with other initiatives to, to come in the, in the future. So just to thank you all of you again. Thank you, ambassadors. It's a great pleasure to see you both uh, again. And thank you, Aurea, Aurea, for your brilliant moderation of the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.